So hopefully uh, you're able to see these uh, slides on your side. Sorry I couldn't be with you live this morning. I ended up having a second uh, meeting in, in my diary. Um, but like that, we can do this session again if needed. Um, myself and Anya and the faculty are having this session again on Thursday, actually, 12 o'clock in uh, Dublin uh, time, if any of you uh, want to join. It's a little bit longer maybe and a little bit more detailed, but this is to give you a nice run through of uh, the fellowship. So essentially the fellowship, it's uh, one of the most prestigious awards that uh, is available to nurses and midwives. And you can see there the post nominals FF, NM or CSI is what you then achieve and can use after your name. So I'm just going to zip through uh, some of these earlier slides because I know uh, Mary, who's on the call, will have taken you through the faculty and our CSI. And there's some nice pictures there of the various um, people that have had the uh, been awarded with the Honorary Fellowship over the years. And one of our most recent uh, awardees, uh, many of you will be familiar with there, is Professor Tedros, who, um, Dr. Tedros, who's the WHO Chief uh, General Director in uh, Geneva. So we had the privilege of being over there. There's the, the board, our executive director here, Professor Thomas Cairns. Uh, that's our uh, current dean, Professor Michael Shannon. Um, and there he is signing his, uh, his parchment. So um, in terms of the fellowship, it was established back in 1982 when the first cohort were conferred. Uh, it's exclusively offered by the RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences, and we're one of the few colleges in the world who can actually uh, make this award. And it's considered a very prestigious professional qualification awarded to nurses and midwives. And really, like other fellowships that you'll be familiar with in architecture um, and other professional disciplines, it's an award that links your your contribution to your profession, society, and in the case of uh, us nurses and midwives, to our patients, service users, colleagues and students. So in terms of eligibility, the fellowship is open to any nurse or midwife from any jurisdiction and from any scope of practice. So that can be clinical, research, education, leadership management um, and any clinical speciality from primary to tertiary care and across the lifespan. So once you have the key requirements here are that you must possess a master's degree in nursing, midwifery or related or applied fields that could be leadership, administration, um, you know, uh, various other uh, areas could be public health. Um, once it's, it's master's level qualification and you must be a registered nurse midwife with, or nurse or midwife with a minimum of five years experience um, and uh, you know registered in your in your own jurisdiction. So the process really for fellowship is that you submit, you uh, complete and submit an online portfolio of evidence and that all happens on the faculty's uh, website. So once you go back to the faculty's homepage about the uh, fellowship, there's a link there that takes you directly in and Anya will take you through that later. Um, now, what you're asked to do for the examination process is in your portfolio is that there's eight areas that you have to complete. So you have to complete your CV which outlines your clinical and professional experience to date and then there's four questions that we ask that really give a very important sense of who you are as a practitioner, the values which you bring to your nursing career. So we ask you initially to reflect on your clinical journey to date and to, to think and reflect on three, two or three pivotal moments across your clinical journey. So, for example, you know, how did you uh, end up as a nurse? Uh, I ended up a lot of my clinical career in intensive care. You know, that didn't ha that happened by fluke, if that makes sense. It was kind of an accidental uh, 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 shift on duty that got me eventually to ICU. So, again, others, you may have had a very defined plan, knew where you wanted to go and work and specialise from when you were younger nurse. So it's it's to sit back now and look over the breadth and the length of your career and kind of say where were there pivotal uh, moments for you. We get you to do the same thing in terms of your academic life. So in terms of your qualifications, was there modules, was there programs that made a big impact on your practice, on your thinking? Uh, let's say some of you did a, a module on health promotion and that gave you new ways of uh, communicating with patients. It gave you new theoretical perspectives that you weren't aware of before. Um, uh, sometimes in Ireland, 
people tell us that when they do the nurse prescribing program and then that really enhances and, and gives them a, a huge uh, uh, uplift in their autonomy uh, because they're able to do uh, more obviously and make more decisions uh, independently with the patient. Uh, the other two questions then we ask you to think about and these are short it's, it's a number of paragraphs but the, the work goes into thinking about what you're going to write on the paper is uh, the other question then is um, tell us about your values what values underpin your practice and just to reassure you this isn't the values of um, you know we don't want 400 values that are checked against a, a code of conduct and a code of ethics what do you believe what are you working by what are your principles what's in your heart what are your values every day when you step into work and the other one then is to think about your teaching and learning philosophy again what do you believe so you many of you will be senior some of you may be uh, less senior but you work with colleagues you're involved in teaching clinically equally you may be mentored by senior colleagues what do you expect in each of those relationships so think of yourself in terms of being the learner in the situation and then being the teacher and educator in the situation. So that's the first kind of uh, section. The next bit then asks you to cover these four areas that we've uh, itemized here. So you have autonomy, professional and clinical leadership because again as you have progressed some of you may be uh, you know very senior uh, levels um, managers and leaders within a healthcare system within an organization so again you may not be uh, essentially it, it can be more professional leadership in, in those roles uh, expertise and research so what we ask you to do in each of these is think about um, what those concepts mean for you so we are not interested in what the literature says on autonomy or leadership. We're very interested in your understanding of the concepts, how you understand them in your career. So, for example, um, in in leadership, you know, are is there principles that you work with? You could say you love things from different models or different frameworks or different theoretical perspectives. Uh, many of us have eclectic uh, styles. You know, you may have some uh, concepts taken from transformational leadership authentic leadership, servant leadership, whatever the, the model maybe that inspires you. Uh, but again, you may have uh, your own sense of what is important for you in leadership. And that's what we're interested in. How has your leadership changed? Uh, I can only speak for myself and say that when I became a clinical nurse manager too early in my career, or earlier in my career, I was more of a micromanager in my first few months and it took me a little bit of time to grow into the role and, and you know, uh, trust other people. Um, so definitely my leadership has become, as I've aged, as I've gained experience, more facilitative. Um, I I'm, believe I'm a much better now in a coaching role facilitating others, whereas in my earlier career I wouldn't have been as, as uh, strong on those areas. So things change for us. The same with your autonomy. When all of us qualified as newly qualified nurses, you know, when you look at the decisions you made then, the frameworks, the things that guided your decision making, um, again, the level of your responsibilities might have been quite different to where you are now in practice. How has that changed across the lifespan of your career and what has in influenced it. So again, sometimes that's back to obviously life experience in general, your clinical experiences. It can be back to, you know, as you become more senior, you may be taking on more responsibility, different type of roles, managing more staff. So your job spec can have an influence there. And again, um, it's back to sometimes our education, our professional uh, judgment then uh, becomes, we have greater knowledge and more in-depth knowledge to guide our decision making. So the same with expertise, how do you understand it uh, and looking at your practice how do you know you are an expert do you believe you're an expert maybe you are in some things maybe you're not in everything and that's a reasonable um, position to take uh, people talk about Benner's work and the continuum of practice sometimes that that's how they see from the novice to expert model um, and again you know these are all of the things you're doing when a colleague talk, calls you at work and says I have a problem here with a patient uh, would you come help or would you come I value your opinion that can be an indication that actually clinically uh, you are you know your peers see you uh, as an expert and in an expert role so consider all of the things that you do as part of your everyday practice 
Research then is the last area. So all of you, because you'll have completed the masters, will have evidence of research. Many of you might have publications. Many of you might be involved in auditing um, and you could be participating in intercollaborative and interprofessional research at work. In terms of the research too, if you're not active in some of those areas, that's not a reason to worry. Think about everything you do as part of your clinical practice. So every guideline we use clinically is underpinned by best available evidence. Many of you can be on committees across the hospital, across your organisation. You can be on committees regionally and feeding into national policy. That all becomes back to where you're using research in your everyday uh, practice. So think of how you're using it at work, are you journal clubs? And I know John, uh, Dr. Sedwich at our last call talked uh, very much about the, the magnet designation. And again, this huge uh, learning and most of you haven't gone through that process, I'm sure are very, very familiar with uh, research and its use in practice. So the portfolio then is examined by two internal examiners uh, who are fellows of the faculty and many of them are obviously experienced examiners. And really it's a 40, once you have the portfolio, portfolio submitted, questions then are directed around your what you have submitted in your portfolio. So the questions are different for everybody in that the questions will focus around the information you've provided. Um, and again, it really is a conversation with two, with a purpose, obviously, but with two colleagues who are very interested in your career. So we're not giving you a job and that, that's the very big difference here with fellowship. Uh, we are, you know, you know that many of you will have interviewed for people for jobs over the years and you have to make decisions who's number one on the panel, number two, number three. We're not doing that. We, everybody, there's no comparison of individuals against each other to see who's best for the role. We are um, assessing, have you as an individual applicant clearly demonstrated your understanding of those concepts? And have you provided some evidence as to how you have achieved them or attained them in your life? So and the evidence can be bullet points saying bullet, bullet, bullet. I led on this. I initiated this. I was involved in this. I contributed to this and give ex specific examples. You know, this was the policy I worked on. I initiated this on my award. Uh, I've been invited and I contribute to some committee. So that is the evidence then to support actually this is how I am able to tell you as examiners that I have a, a very clear understanding of how I understand the, these concepts and how I uh, operationalize them in my career. So um, that really then so you're invited to the Viva Vacha which is uh, I think it's Latin uh, for an oral examination really is what it means. Well, so the portfolio of evidence is explored through a critical discussion between examiners and the applicant and that's 40 minutes. It sounds intimidating but actually if you break it down there's two minutes to say hello and welcome. There's two minutes at the end to say thank you for coming. We're delighted to have you uh, participate. So that gives you about 36 minutes for four concepts and they have to cover e equal um, time for each of them. So it's about nine minutes then you're going to be discussing uh, certain concepts. So it's it's very um, that I think it makes it much more understandable that you know it's it's many of you I'm sure if we talked about research or leadership or autonomy you'd have lots of things to say and you could talk for much longer than than the nine minutes. And an external examiner reviews all aspects of the process ensuring that standards and quality assurance processes are maintained and that's very very, very important. Um, in terms of the benefits for fellowship, um, so really the fellowship, um, number one, you're conferred with the post nominals, that's what you call them, the FFNM or CSI, and you can use that after your name. But it also means that you are part of an extensive professional network of nurses and midwives nationally and internationally. Uh, we run an annual program of fellows, um, actually members should be in there now, so fellows, members and friends events and faculty events. Uh, you will have hopefully opportunities to in interact with and network with professional colleagues. We have opportunities to engage in research and teaching in collaboration with the faculty. And we run an annual conference which celebrates its 40, uh, 40th year in 2021. So we're heading into 42 years at 40. 
one. Our next, con it's our, we have a conference this June, so that will be our 41st conference. We're hosting it for a Sigma a European uh, conference. So next year will be our 42nd conference. Um, so you were in, uh, uh, invited to attend, obviously, with some discounted rates for the fee. Um, and then you can influence faculty governance once you're in good standing, and that is that you can uh, contest and vote in faculty board elections. So the cost of fellowship, this is normally 500 euros. Um, and you make payment in the system. So you log on, register, and that will become part of the process there. But the important thing to say here from the faculty's perspective is that the fee was reduced uh, for this year and last year. Um, as our way, the faculty board um, really wants to acknowledge the contribution of nurses and midwives to uh, global health and the fee was reduced in order to, as our way of saying thank you um, and that we do appreciate and we do respect um, the work of our colleagues on the front line. So that is definitely, um, you know, it will go back up again, but definitely it's it's uh, staying at 250 euros for this year. The examination fee then uh, covers your fees for the following year. So if you do this year, you won't be uh, required to pay a fee in 2023. And then annually, the cost of to, uh, cost of fellowship is 50 euros, 50 euros annually. So it's not hopefully from for many of you, that's not overly um, expensive. Um, so I am now going to hand you back uh, to uh, Anya and to Mary. Um, we we'll really look forward to supporting you. I know John has a plan um, to, to help many of you and facilitate, you know, groups if, if there's interest. Um, I'll happily do whatever um, I can if, if we need to have further calls. Uh, we're more than happy to support. We uh, support you all in that and we're really uh, excited and delighted that you are uh, considering this. So thank you so much for your time and I look forward to meeting you all again. Bye now. Thank you.